coming into Christmas, everyone's pretty much in the full swing of the holiday season, and uh, Christmas is, what, 15 days away to be exact. And I really was praying about, you know, what type of a message God would lay on our hearts uh, within the next uh, coming Sundays. And, you know, most pastors will go into the Gospel of Luke, the Nativity story, or Matthew, and, and really just preach on the, the birth of Jesus Christ. And we'll do that. Um, but three weeks away, three Sundays away from Christmas, I kind of want to do a little series, a, a three-Sunday series kind of leading into uh, this Christmas and maybe present some stuff maybe that you've never seen before, maybe never heard before. And so I, I really want to talk about some Old Testament verses, and we'll go over a New Testament verse today. I really want to talk about the mystery. The mystery that really surrounded the person of Jesus Christ and how the prophets in the Old Testament really were mystified about who Jesus was, who this person was to come. And so our title today will be The Jesus of Christmas, but the mystery of His person and how He was prophesied in the Old Testament, but revealed in the New. And the reason why I say that is when you read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, it says the prophets searched diligently into the very things that they wrote. And what this is referring to is that even the prophets, as they wrote the Word of God, as they wrote the Scripture, inspired Word of God, even as they were writing, they were searching diligently into the very things that they were writing. Imagine you writing a book and then turning right around and studying the very book that you wrote because you didn't understand the book. It's exactly what the prophets were doing. They were inspired by God to write Holy Scripture, which is inspired by God. And as they were writing the Word of God, they were diligently searching in the Word of God. Because there were some things that were mystifying to them. There were some things that were hard for them to understand. There were some things that weren't yet really clear to them. But yet they wrote. Yet they were inspired. And yet the Word of God is fully the Word of God written down by men who were inspired by the Holy Ghost of God. And really even into the New Testament, there was this mystery of who Jesus was. You remember in Matthew chapter 16, namely verse 14, when Jesus asked Peter, He says, Who do men say that I am? Do you remember the answers? The answer was, Some men say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. Others say you're Jeremiah. Some even just say you're one of the prophets. <coughs> even during Jesus' day when He preached and when he teached, people were mystified on who this man was. He says he's the Messiah. He says he's the anointed one of God. He says he's here to bring the kingdom of God. But he just looks like a normal Jewish man. He looks like a prophet. looks like a Jeremiah. looks like an Elijah. I mean, the people were mystified. Even the disciples themselves. Even the disciples themselves had some thought about who He really was. You know, they were learning as they were being discipled by Him. I mean, you remember in John's Gospel, chapter 1, one of the things that they said was, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, are you really the Messiah? You're coming out of little old Nazareth? I mean, the Messiah should come out of Jerusalem, don't you think? The royal city? No, you're raised in Nazareth. And you remember we did the series in the Gospel of Luke chapter 7 on when believers doubt and how John the Baptist was in prison. And you remember what John the Baptist does? Of all people, of all the spiritual giants in our faith, John the Baptist is in prison and he sends his two disciples back to Jesus and says, I need you to ask him, is he the one or should we be looking for another? And of all people, John the Baptist was mystified on the person of Jesus Christ. And when I say mystified, I don't mean they didn't believe. I mean, they believed, but they just had some things that were hard to understand. And yet only the Spirit of God can do that. And one of the reasons why there was such mystery that enshrouded the person of Jesus Christ is because the New Testament really hadn't unfolded yet. I mean, all of the hundreds and thousands of prophecies in the Old Testament that pointed into the New Testament, 
But none of them really had been fulfilled in such a way to where it could really point to who Jesus really was. I mean, the rug of prophecy was just being unrolled and they were just starting to see the picture that was on the tapestry of the Old Testament. They were just now starting to get a glimpse of who this person was. So they still had great mystery. And you know what? The world today is still mystified by Jesus. Right now, people are hustling and bustling, going to the shops and going to places and picking out gifts and wrapping gifts and putting them under trees and putting real nice little cute little notes on the gifts and under the trees, which I totally believe in. But they really don't understand the real spirit of Christmas. They're mystified still today. You drive by storefronts that on the window, instead of saying Happy Christmas, it says Happy Xmas, taking Christ's name out. And people are mystified by who this person was, but yet they want to celebrate his birth. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. But those who believe, the church of Jesus Christ, there's no mystery. For people who believe in the Savior, there is no mystery whatsoever. We know exactly who Jesus is. He has revealed Himself to our hearts the moment we were born again. And every single day after that that we spend in His presence, He reveals who He really is to our hearts. There is no mystery to the church. There is no mystery. And so this morning, I want to show you two mysteries. I want to share with you two mysteries that are found in the Old Testament that are very important to understand that really give us the heart and spirit of Christmas. And this will kind of be a set-up message for the next two Sundays to come. And so I want to approach this by going back into the Old Testament. If you take your Bibles, I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 7, and this will kind of be our launching point this morning. We're going to look at three or four passages along the way. To have your Bible handy and ready with you, or you can just listen. Isaiah chapter 7, this is 700 years before Jesus is born. Isaiah chapter 7, one little verse, verse 14. This is where it all started as far as a clear, definitive look at the birth of Jesus Christ. Verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. Here it is. That big verse that prophesied that when Jesus comes into the world, He will come into the world in such a way that will be unparalleled that will be the greatest way of all people ever coming into this world. And it won't just be by a woman, but it will be through a virgin birth. Now that's unusual. Impossible with man, but possible with God. But notice the first part of this verse says that He will give a sign. The Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Isaiah is speaking to the Jews. This is prophecy 700 years before Jesus is born. And do you know what the Jews were always doing? Always looking for a sign. They were always looking for signs to validate their commitment to the true and living God. They needed reassurance constantly that they were going in the right direction. The Jews were always looking for miracles and always looking for something that would point them to God. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul wrote of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Paul says, For the Jews require a sign, and the Gentiles seek after wisdom. You see, it was the Jews that they needed something that they could see. They were always looking for tangibility. Oh, the only way we'll believe is if you show us a sign. You remember all of the mantra all through the Gospels and how all the religious leaders and all the people always went to Jesus and said, if you really are who you say you are, show us a sign. Always looking for the sign. Always needing the tangibility in their hands and being able to see it. And guess what? 
The Lord gave them one. The Lord gave them a sign. I mean, that's what this verse says. The Lord Himself shall give you a sign. So what is the sign? 700 years, fast forward into the Gospels, there is going to be a virgin, and she, her name is going to be Mary. And in her womb is going to be Emmanuel, God with us, and that is your sign. And you know what? They missed it miserably. They were looking for every other thing to happen possibly, looking for all these other signs and all these other miracles, and the sign of Christmas was sitting right there in a manger. And you would have thought the Jews would have picked up on that. They prided themselves in their knowledge of the Old Testament. You know, from a very young age, the Jews, the children were raised in the Torah, raised in the Old Testament, and as they developed and wanted to take the path to be rabbis and scholars, I mean, they really prided themselves in interpreting the Old Testament prophecies. If anyone should have knew about the sign, it should have been the Jews. But they missed it. They believed that the Messiah would come. They believed the Messiah would be the anointed one of God. They believed the Messiah would be the Savior Himself. They believed the Messiah would even bring in the eternal kingdom. But the Messiah being virgin born? Mystery. Never heard of that? Is that the way it was supposed to happen? I mean, if you really read the Old Testament, there's really scarce amount of verses that really point to the virgin birth. This is probably the most definitive one. The other one is in Genesis 3.15 where Jesus Christ is called the seed of the woman, which I may add, the woman doesn't have a seed. So even that impossibility was made possible through the Lord Jesus Christ. The man carries the seed. Very scarce amount of verses that point to the virgin birth in the Old Testament. Now wonder the prophets were mystified on the entrance of the Savior in the world. But here it is, 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, and they prided themselves in their knowledge of the Bible, but missed it. I mean, you want a sign? Here it is on a platter. You need to be looking for a girl who's going to give birth to a son and his name's going to be Emmanuel and she's going to be a virgin. That's what you need to be looking for. Don't worry about the signs in the sky. Don't worry about the signs in your land. Worry about the sign of a, a girl uh, giving birth to God in a manger. That's the sign. And sometimes we can put our focus in the wrong direction, in the wrong things, and miss the sign. And you know what? The world today is still missing. They're still missing it. They're still missing that the reason for the season isn't because we love each other. It isn't because of the sweet fellowship that we have. The reason for the season is because Jesus Christ entered this world through the womb of a virgin. That's the reason for the season. It all points to Him, who He is and what He's done. 700 years before Isaiah is saying, here's a mystery, the virgin birth. Let me show you another mystery. Just go two chapters over, Isaiah chapter 9. This is where it really starts getting interesting. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to look at verse 6. The mystery of the virgin birth, the conception of the Son but now the second mystery is found in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and it reads this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Stop right there. Now this is, I mean, a pretty good verse. I mean, whoever this child is that is going to be born right here in this verse the government's going to be upon his shoulder. That's not unusual. This could be referring to just a mere prophet or a guru or a leader of God coming into the world. I mean, a son is given. The government's going to be on his shoulder. He'll be a ruler. He'll be a king. That's not unusual. Not unusual that someone should be called wonderful. Not unusual that someone should be called a counselor. That's not unusual to have that. But the next title is unusual. And the next title says that this son that's going to be given, this child that's going to be born, he shall be called the mighty God. Not a 
God amongst other gods, but the God. In the Hebrew, it's definite article. It means there is no one that can be even paralleled next to him. He's in a class and category all by himself. The mighty God. Now that title is unusual. Especially in the same verse where it talks about a child is born. A son is given. I mean, here's the divine paradox. I mean, that this child will be born of a virgin, would be human, but at the same time fully the mighty God. Now, there's a paradox to get your thoughts going there. I mean, how can anyone be God and man at the same time? I mean, that's baffling. That's a mystery. That's a mystery all by itself. The scripture is very clear that the Savior in whom we serve is 100% fully God and 100% fully man. One person with a divine nature and a human nature, yet without sin. And here in one little verse, this verse says that this child who is going to be born is also called the mighty God and the everlasting Father. I mean, the one who fathered eternity. And you know what? People still stumble over this reality. I mean, when you talk to people of other religions, of other faiths, the moment you say that Jesus Christ is God, they just go into an uproar. They're still stumbling over this truth when it is so evident all through the Bible that Jesus Christ, the one in whom we serve, is fully God. I mean, but how can it be that a woman that should give birth to the child when actually the child is the one that made the woman. I mean, how could it be that the child who would be in the very womb of the woman was the woman's creator herself? I mean, that's pretty mysterious. That the child that was in that womb was bigger than the universe. That the baby that was born was not just a baby, but the eternal God, God born in a manger. I mean, he that thunders from the heavens would even subject himself to cry in the cradle. Now that is a mystery. That the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who created the expanse and the galaxies would subject himself to mere time by entering this world through all places, the womb of of a virgin. Now that's a mystery. How could it be that God Himself, so big, so large, so huge, could compact Himself right inside the womb of a Mary and then allow Himself to go through a nine-month process of being able to build His own shell of limbs and arms and eyes and ears in the womb when He Himself is God? Almost like a king stepping down out of his kingdom and jumping into a sewer. I tell you what, this great God in whom we serve has such love for us. Amen. I mean so much love that I don't even think we can really fully grasp it all. I mean in creation, in Genesis 1, it says man was created and made in the likeness and the image of God. But in the virgin birth, God was made in the likeness and image of man. Now that's a role reversal if I've ever seen one. And guess what? The great truth and central truth of the Christian faith is that Jesus Christ is fully God and He is fully man and He has to be so because in able for Him to forgive sins, He has to be fully God and able for Him to die for our sins, He has to be fully man. There is no other way around it. That is the great stumbling block in our faith. Other people look at us and they look at Jesus and say He was a mere man, a mere prophet, just a spiritual guru. Oh no, He was more than that. He was way more than that. He is the mighty God. Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I mean, this is pretty clear. But this was a mystery. 
The person of Jesus Christ was enshrouded in this great mystery of who is he going to be? What is he going to look like? You really have to think about this. The Old Testament spans almost 4,000 plus years. And you have generations of generations of generations of Jewish people who are looking into these prophecies and they are growing up and dying and growing up and dying and they're never able to see the Messiah and then boom, he comes in the womb of a virgin. He comes into Jerusalem and begins to preach and teach and the people are just stuck. They've been waiting thousands of years. <laughs> They've been hearing about this great Messiah that's going to show up, and they've never seen Him. All they've done is heard their father talk about it, and their grandfathers talk about it, and their distant family talk about it, but they've never seen Him. And then He shows up, and He preaches and teaches, and He looks like you and me, and He says He's God, and people are baffled. How can God be man and God at the same time? Mystery. Go to the book of Micah for a second. Micah is right before Jonah. I'm going to show you another really, really interesting verse. Right before Jonah, right after Amos. Micah chapter 5. I'm going to get you a little closer to who Christ is. During Christmas, we celebrate the virgin birth. We celebrate the advent of Jesus coming into this world. But it's way more than just that. It's who He is, not just how He came into the world. It's who He is as a person. Don't get stuck on where He was born. Get stuck on who He is as a person because that's what benefits. I mean, what is it to know all of the, the intellectual treats of who Jesus is and where He's been, what He's done if you never believe? <laughs> I mean, you can know a lot about someone and not really know them personally. I mean, you can know all of the accolades that Michael Jordan has. You can know all of the accolades that Tom Brady has. You can know all of the accolades that all of your favorite sports figures have. But if you've never met him personally, you don't know him. You can know a lot about someone and never really know him. You need to know who he is as a person. Micah chapter 5, I just want to read one little verse, verse 2. But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah. Stop right there. Micah is prophesying and he's speaking to Bethlehem. He's not speaking to an individual. He's speaking into an entire region, an entire city. And he's saying, Bethlehem, I want you to know something right now. Though you may be little among the thousands of Judah, and what he's referring to there is Bethlehem is so far off the beaten trail, so far off the beaten track, it is a real tiny, small little town. And though you're a tiny, little, obscure town among the other thousands, it's referring to the cities and the towns and the regions, something very marvelous is going to happen in your little town. Something more marvelous than you don't even know. And what does he say? Yet out of thee, out of Bethlehem, shall he, referring to Jesus, come forth unto me, referring to the Father, that is to be the ruler in Israel, watch this, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. You see that last phrase, from everlasting? It's unfortunate that some translations change that and put from ancient times. Because when you put from ancient times in that phrase, you almost kind of imply that there was a start to his existence. And the Hebrew phrase here does nothing of the sort. The Hebrew phrase here is yachum. And it's a phrase that refers to eternality. And what is Micah saying? What's the point here? The point is this. Little old Bethlehem, in that little old town, is going to spring out the Messiah out of this little town. And Michael wants the people to be so well informed that he wants the people to understand that when this baby is born, when this child comes into the world, I don't want you to be misinformed that his existence didn't start in the womb of Mary, but he is from everlasting. That's what he wants them to understand. That this just isn't some baby in a manger. 
as this is to some child that's playing in the streets of Bethlehem, that the person is going to be born, his existence never began because he himself upholds his own existence. And how can it be that baby is a baby and a child, but yet he's God at the same time? That's the mystery. Divine paradox, but the scripture is clear. In the same verse, it says he's a child and he's a he's born of a virgin, and, and, and then also he's from everlasting. And what a paradox. And he wants them to understand that Christ is the eternal one. Really, really important to get that. Really, really important to understand that other religions teach that Jesus Christ is a created being. He's not created. He's God Himself. His shell was created in the womb. That's it. His existence didn't start in the womb of Mary. He has been from everlasting. He just chose to enter into the world through the womb of a virgin and the virgin He Himself made. I mean, that's got to be humble. To enter into the world in such a way to where you created the person that you came through. Flip over to Luke chapter 1, and this will kind of be our setting point right here. We'll just sit down here for the next 10 minutes. Luke chapter 1. This is kind of the classic passage that we usually preach from on Christmas, but leading up to Christmas, like I said, I just kind of want to give you a sweep of what's going on here. That the God of eternity itself is Jesus Christ Himself, born in a manger. Luke chapter 1. Drop down to verse 26. We'll read a handful of verses here. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So here, uh, the Father dispatches Gabriel from heaven all the way down to Nazareth. Now, where does the angel come to? Verse 27, To a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed thou among women. And look at Mary's response in verse 29. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. I mean, you really got to figure this out here. She is not just troubled. The word there is she's terrified. There's an angel talking to her. <laughs> not only talking to her, telling her, hey, I know you're a virgin. I know you've never had any sexual intercourse with a man. I know a man has never touched you, but you're going to have a baby that's going to be growing on the inside of your womb, and that baby's going to be named Jesus. That baby's going to be Emmanuel, God with this. I'd be terrified too. I mean, where did this angel come from? Highly favored. God sends the angel to talk with Mary, and Mary's initial response is she's terrified. She's troubled. In verse 30, and the angel said unto her, Fear not. And that's how you know it was more than just a troubled. It was really a terrified because the angel says, Fear not. Don't you fear. Probably startled in more ways than one. Why shouldn't you fear? Because you found favor with God. That's a good thing, right? That'll dissipate all the fear when an angel dispatched from heaven tells you, Hey, fear not. You're favored by God. I mean, that's a beautiful thing to hear that. Verse 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth the Son, and shall call his name Jesus. And here it is, verse 32, And he shall be great. Stop right there. He shall be called great. He shall be great. Uh, the, the language here is, He shall be noble. He shall be distinguished. He shall be illustrious. These are all synonyms of the Greek word that's mentioned right here, great. But what it's referring to is that this is going to be the greatest baby ever born. And I know you're thinking about what Jesus said about John the Baptist, that he would be the greatest person ever born from the womb of a woman. And you're absolutely right. And God the Father is who made John the Baptist good. And this is something different here. 
This baby is going to be great, not because the father makes him great, but because the son himself is great in his own essential nature. No one makes Jesus great. He is great. And so he will be the greatest person ever born. He is God himself. Doesn't need anyone to validate him. Doesn't need the world to validate his existence. He's God. And here he's born and he's called great. And if you really look at his life, it was great, wasn't it? I mean, just his teachings were so compassionate. His servanthood was so compassionate. His wisdom, his power, his authority, everything in his life truly was great. But not only that, notice he's called the son of the highest. And here's where people stumble. They're like, well, if Jesus Christ is God, how is he called the son of the highest? Who is the highest? Obviously, God the Father. But not highest as far as the son is second and the spirit of God is third. Not highest in a, in a ladder order, but highest as far as the father is in heaven and the son came to the world to do the plan, to do the mission. He's the son of the highest. That word highest is a title that's always attributed to God the father in the Old Testament especially. He is the highest. He is the utmost. He is the highest. In the Hebrew, it's El Elohim. It's a word that refers to He is the supreme being. There's no one else that's higher than Him. He is the supreme, exalted being of the entire universe. And who is His Son? Jesus Christ is His Son. Well, that sounds contradictory. Sounds like you're saying Jesus isn't God. No, I'm saying Jesus isn't the Father. Don't get that mixed up. And Christianity, the essential truth of the Trinity that we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Those three are each individual persons, yet one God. Well, how can that be? Ask God. That's the divine paradox. There's so many things in this world that are made in threes, but we look at, look at them as ones. I'll start with mathematics. One times one times one is what? One. H2O, three particles, one substance. So many different things in this world that are calculated in threes, but we look at them as one. And here, the Son of God, He is the Son of the Highest. He's Son of the Father. He is the eternal Son of God. Micah says He's from everlasting. Isaiah says that He is the mighty God. There can't be two gods. Not two mighty gods. Only one mighty God. I mean, what is this saying? This is saying that Jesus bears the exact same essence and nature as God Himself. I mean, He is the Son of God. He is the Son. That's His role. I mean, it's John 1.1. 1, 1. We all know it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's John 5.18 that says... Also, God was His Father making Himself equal with God. It's John 10.30 where Jesus looks at the religious leaders right in their face and He says, I and my Father are one. One in essence. One in person. One in essential being. All of the characteristics and attributes that make God the Father, Jesus Christ, is God the Son. And the mystery is that this child can be a man, but also be fully God. The mystery is that the, on the one hand, this child is born of Mary, but on the other hand, this child has no earthly father by descent. And the mystery is that on the one hand, this child grew to 33 plus years and died on a cross, but on the other hand, He is God Himself and able to forgive sins. Let me give you something paradoxical to deal with. God died on the cross. Acts 20, 28 says it. The Old Testament said that He would be the seed of the woman. The Old Testament said He would come through the lineage of Abraham. 
that he would come through the royal line of David, but that he would also be produced from heaven, that he would come down from God. How can it be? How can he come from the seed of the woman and be produced from Abraham and be produced from David and be produced from God? How can it be all of them? We're not dealing with the simplest of persons. We're dealing with the eternal God made in human form and trying to reveal who he, who he is to me and to you. I mean, all through the Gospels, you see these three titles. Son of God, Son of Man, Son of David. All three of those titles you see all through the Gospels 20 or 30 times. Some people are calling Him the Son of David. Others are calling Him the Son of God. Others are calling Him the Son of Man. All three titles all start with Son of. What are they there for? Anytime you see the title Son of God, it's identifying Jesus Christ with His deity. That He is fully God. He is God in the flesh. It is identifying Him with divinity, that He is divine, that He is God. Anytime they say Son of Man, they're identifying with His humanity, that He is fully 100% man, yet without sin. And He suffered the same way we suffered. He's tempted the same way we're tempted. And He is fully a man. When they say He's the Son of David, they're identifying Him with royalty, that He is a king. He came through the line of David. And He will inherit a throne and He will usher in an eternal kingdom. Son of God, He's deity. Son of man, He's humanity. Son of David, He's royalty. All three titles all mean something. How is He all three? This divine complex prophecies of the Old Testament are all resolved in the person of Jesus Christ. Not anything that we can figure out. No wonder the prophets were mystified. <coughs> I'm going to give you a verse that will just put it all out in the open. 1 Timothy chapter 3. This will be the last verse. 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to give it to you in the words of Paul. One little verse that's going to open it up very clear for you. You ought to underline this verse. This is how the Apostle Paul put it. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I love the way this verse starts, by the way. It says, and without controversy, meaning there's no arguing about this. Then it might be controversial in the world, controversial to people who don't believe it. There really is no arguing about this. It's without controversy. What's without controversy? Great is the mystery. There's the word mystery. It's a biblical word. Paul used it. Jesus used it. And that's why we're using it. Great is the mystery of godliness. What's the mystery, Paul? God was manifested in the flesh. You see it right there? Crystal clear. If you ever wanted to know who Jesus Christ is, it's crystal clear right here in this verse. That is without controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. Jesus Christ, God Himself, was manifested in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. And you know what's really, really important is Christmas really doesn't have to be mystified. I mean, Christmas doesn't have to be some mystical celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. We don't really have to follow some hoax named Jesus Christ. I mean, we can really get to know who Jesus is. And if you're a believer, you do know who He is. If you're a believer, Jesus is not a mystery to you. He has been fully revealed, heart to heart, face to face, who He really is to you. But to those that are your friends and your neighbors and those who don't know Him, He is yet still a mystery. And what good is it? If Christ be born into the world, unless He be born into our hearts. I mean, we celebrate the Advent, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, but what good is it uh, on the 24th of Sunday if all of this country packs the pews and the pastor preaches his great oracle sermon out of the Gospel of Luke and talks about the virgin birth if the people in the pews don't have Christ born in their hearts? It's just another Sunday. Just another day to get gifts. Just another day to celebrate. The real reason for the season is the person of Jesus Christ. And that if you don't know Him personally, 
He can be born into your heart today. And it all just happens by just simple faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ. And that yes, He came down from heaven. That He was born of a virgin. That He lived 33 plus years. Perfect, sinless life. Full of righteousness. That He went to the cross. He died for you. That you might be the righteousness of God. That your sins might be imputed to Him. And His righteousness and His perfect life imputed to you. And that He rose on the third day with all power in His hand to give you life. That's the real spirit of Christmas. The real spirit of Christmas is our great Savior loves us. And He gave His life for us. But it didn't start in a manger. It started with a plan in heaven to come save humanity. The womb and the manger were just the entrance on the way in. And we're so thankful for that. So thankful that he picked that way to do it because I want to tell you something. There has never been a birth ever like that in the human history. I mean, God can do whatever He wants to do, right? I mean, why did He just drop down on Good Friday, live, and just die, go straight to the cross, live on this earth for a couple hours, and then raise on Sunday? I mean, why did He pick the hard way? I mean, God just dropped Jesus out of heaven, out of heaven Friday, go to the cross, die, raise on Sunday, and let it be said. No. He leaves a exemplary life of servanthood, led a life of humility, led a life that taught us great principles to live by. He led 33 years of living and loving and compassionately and earnestly beckoning lost souls to Himself. And His full life of righteousness and His perfect life, God the Father was satisfied with when He died on the cross, and that life can be yours. I sometimes... When I lay down at night, I, after I preach on Sundays, I ask myself, did I present the gospel? You know, a lot of times a pastor can get in a rut where all he does every Sunday is preach the gospel. And so the people just get full of gospel preaching. And rather than teaching, you know, methodically through verses and books of the Bible and, and so many different things to teach on, how to raise your children, how to have wisdom, how to go through trials. I mean, there's just a plethora of, of topics that are in these 66 books that you can really teach of. But I just want to be really clear about this. That none of the principles in the Bible will get you to heaven other than believing in who Jesus Christ is. And if I have got up here every Sunday and I have never told you that, I have not done my job. And so when I first came to this church and I first got into this church, I, I really wanted to feel the atmosphere of the people here and what they had been taught and what they believed. And the Spirit of God just kept placing on my heart, you just keep preaching the gospel. You'll get into the other stuff. I mean, this isn't a fast foot race. We're in this for the long haul. And so I just want to tell you that there's... So many, many years to come if the Lord willing and allow us to stay here. Well, we're just going to get into so much stuff in the Bible. So just bear with me as I preach the gospel every Sunday because I want to tell you this is something that gets us all into heaven. And you know something else? Just because you sit in the pew doesn't mean you're saved. And I would be a fool to think that everyone that comes into the church is saved because they're in the church. I must give you gospel. I must give you Jesus. Without that, my conscience is riddled. Please bow your heads. Lord, we, we thank you so much for your gospel. We thank you so much for your birth. Thank you, Lord, that you entered this world in such a unique way and that your advent, Lord, was celebrated among those who believed in you as it is celebrated today, 2,000 years later, among those who believe in you. <coughs> We thank you for these four weeks in December where we can really prepare our hearts and remember the Advent, where we can remember the hope and joy and love and salvation that you brought this world and those who believe. We pray that you would just open our hearts more, that you would build this church more, that you would grow this church in a way that's honorable to you. And we just pray as we partake of communion in the Lord's Supper that you would be pleased with our efforts as we serve you. 
forgive us for our sins. Help us in areas, Lord, where we're weak. And help us to evangelize to the lost. We love you and we thank you so much for this church and for the people that really feel this church. Thank you for all of their efforts. The Lord, just continue to bring us more people. We love you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. At this time, we'll move into um, our communion service.